All right, so we are in geometry. Today's date is Tuesday, December 3rd, 12 slash 3, 2019. That's the wrong date. There it is. Um, we are on our brand new unit, congruence. Congruence is just how our shape's the same. So if I come over here to our unit guide, look how short this unit guide is. It's three lessons and a test. Your test is on Friday which means you have another chance for your grade to go up or down, hopefully in the upward direction. Coming back, this is the first of the three lessons for this unit. So, can someone with a quiet raised hand read our objective, Jessica? There it is, thank you. You can turn in your card, and our game warden will give you the 50 XP. So let's start with some vocab. This was from the warm-up yesterday, a transformation. Give me the four types of transformations. Quiet raised hand. Gunner, please take off your sunglasses. Julian, go for it. Uh, uh, okay, okay. There it is. Make sure you know all of these four transformations. This is all from Unit 2. Unit 2 is all about how to do these things, their properties. So, now what is the definition of a rigid transformation? I defined this for you yesterday. They preserve two things. What and what? Who has their card still? Gunner. Well, angles. <coughs> <laughs> there it is. Length. And Andres, please tell me which one of these four transformations that we have written up here is not a rigid transformation. You got this. Exactly. So this one, you can go up here and you can do a, a line through dilation. A dilation is not a rigid transformation. So what we're using today is we're only using these things. So if a shape can be mapped onto another shape using blank, blank, then the two shapes are congruent. Before someone answers that question from Gunner. I definitely said it was not a rigid transformation. I said one, two, and three were, but not and four. Said, and then four. I think you are misremembering because I, I highly doubt that I would make that type of mistake. But I am human. I might have made that mistake. Um, let's answer this question now. Using what will map one shape to the other, which means the shapes are congruent. I just defined it up here. There are two words. I said that we're using these things over and over again. Who has their card? You guys got this. Go for it, Fernando. Uh, angles and lengths. Good guess, but not quite. It's the thing that that is defining. Oh, sorry. Starts with an R, rigid. Rigid, rigid, uh, rigid transformation. Rigid translation. Good job, Bill. <laughs> rigid transformations. Okay, so that's the main takeaway from today. Is if I can use rigid transformations, if I can use translations, reflections, and rotations to make one shape overlap onto the second shape, those two shapes are the same. That's called mapping one shape onto another. If those shapes perfectly overlap, only using these three things, that is a proof that they are congruent. Gunner. What if you dilate the small and then dilate the small back? As long as you dilate by the reciprocal, then that's fine. But um, let's talk about example number one. So I need to know if these two triangles are congruent. Let's just take a guess. Just yeah. eyeball it. Yeah. Give me thumbs up or thumbs down. Let's eyeball it. You, sometimes you can just, yeah, yeah like, they're yes or no. Like, what, is, what do you think? So it looks like two people say no. Every, three people say no. Everyone else says yes. So let's test it out. And you can't really do this unless you have, not easily without um, technology. But a good way to do these also is just to count how long they are. I gave you a grid. 
Um, but let's, how would you map this? Can we, can someone describe the process of mapping, um, let's say, A, B, C onto um, F, E, D? How do I get this red triangle onto the blue triangle? What are the few operations that I'd have to do in terms of first do a translation, then reflection, then rotation, stuff like that? What do I do? Who has their cards still? Andreas, yeah. Do you have your cards? Yes. Um, so you, would, you can do a single rotation. A single rotation around which point? Yeah, where is it though? But there's no coordinates. You can come up and point. I, wait, I don't even know what yeah, it is. Like that point over there. I said you can come up and you can actually say oh, that point right there or that point right there. Which point would you rotate around? Um, wait, do I put it? Come? Yeah, which so, point would you rotate around first? I'm not. I don't know. If, I don't think this is gonna be exact. So remember that in order for that to be rotated, I, it could be actually. Um, let's talk to someone else for a discussion. Sergio has his card. That would be a little bit more efficient. It's right in between at this part right here. So it's halfway between, halfway between. So this point right here would be the easier point to rotate around. But there's even easier way to do it because on Khan Academy, you cannot graph non-lattice points. So, yes, it would be nice to rotate about that point. Gunnar, let's talk to us. Nice and efficient. Okay, so translation and then a rotation. So let's see what happens. If I translate this, then my new triangle is going to come here. It's going to come here. So I'm really going left two down one, left two down one, left two down one. So my new points would be like that. And then from there, I would do a rotation. Gunner, how many degrees would we rotate it? 90 degrees would make this line go to right there. Or I guess if it's positive, 90 would go to right there. 270 would go here, then here, then here. That's 180. Yeah, 180. So that would make this point go from here to about here to about here. So let's check if that actually rotates. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it actually rotates it right there. And then this point, if you're rotating by 180 degrees, it's kind of hard to do without coordinates. Um, but it's going to be right about there, I think. So what we did was we did two steps. We did a translate. I can't spell translate. Um, left, two, and then down one. And then from there, we rotate. about point, it was point C in this case, I think, point C, and we rotated 180 degrees. And we see that it does not actually map onto itself. And it's just because that we had wrong dimensions. You can check this has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And this one was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the lengths, the sides of the triangles were off. They looked really close, but until you actually do your transformations, that will show you that there's a slight piece that's wrong. Uh, Andres, yeah? So if, if like that triangle was congruent to the other one, can you map that triangle? Can you dilate by don't, <laughs> I mean, you're being tricky. If you dilate by negative one, I guess it's still okay, but try to use just rigid transformations. The dilation is not defined as a rigid transformation, so only using rotation, I mean, you're correct. If you just do by negative one, that's essentially a rotation by 180 degrees, right? So yes, you can do that, and it's not formally true, but it still works. So, method, right? I just 
I'll give it to you guys. Okay, so that's how you do it on Khan Academy. It's pretty straightforward. And my hint for you guys is use Gunner's strategy. I'm going to call it Gunner's strategy because he and I talked about it first, which is your first step is almost always going to be a translate. Your first step almost always will be a translate. Try to get one point on top of another and then do other things from there. Then you do a rotation after translate. Or after translate, then you would do a reflection. Translate should normally be your first transformation. It makes it so much easier if you do a translation first. I'll do one problem on Khan Academy just so you can see how it works. And then from there, I want to go on to our puzzle, which is on the back side of our page. All right, so if I come here to assign... That's all of our transformations. Let's do our congruence. All right, so I need to map this blue shape onto this red shape. Let's just eyeball it right now. Do you guys think that they're congruent? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Take a guess. No, because you you made me think, no. believe that they that <laughs> Nothing is ever congruent. Okay, well, let's try it, right? I'm going to translate it first. Let me zoom in here so you can actually see what I'm doing. I think that this point A is probably going to map onto that point D. And then from there, I think I'm going to have to... A rotate probably wouldn't work. I think I'm going to have to reflect. Yes. And I'm probably going to reflect it like that. Oh, it's exactly on the same spot. So after doing it, I say, yes, they are congruent. Zoom back out here and say, check. Go. Done. That's how you do the homework, and it's four questions, you're done. But because that's so fast, I want to talk about Fight Club. No, I want to talk about this guy. That's so easy. Like, anyone... I want to know how this is possible. We're talking about translations, rotations. This is purely only translations. Theoretically, these two triangles should be the same, yet just doing translation, it seems to break this rule. I have a missing square right here. How the heck do I have a missing square right here if I started with the same exact shapes and I'm just moving those shapes around? So if you flip over the back side of your notes, you'll have both of these shapes, I think. Both of those shapes how is it possible that these two triangles, they appear to be congruent, yet one is missing a square? And to explore this, everyone needs to grab some scissors. Wait, but this is easy. It's obviously because... Oh, if it's obvious, go ahead and write down your answer. Okay. Because Isaac Newton... Yeah, If it's a real answer that's not a joke answer, you can write down your answer. Otherwise... Everyone, grab some scissors. We're going to have a packet where you can cut these shapes out and figure out what is going on here. Essentially, you're doing this. All right, so we have been talking about this puzzle, which is very related to this puzzle where I have chocolate that seems to endlessly give me more chocolate. Um, again, you can look at Math Stack Exchange, the magic chocolate bar illusion. Here is the answer. Well, you guys are helping me. Look at your slopes for the triangles. So this is obviously two. I count one, two, three, four, five. That has a length of five, which means this is also two and five. They're the same piece. And this has a length of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and three. Three eighths, right? So the slope here is three eighths. The slope here is two fifths. What is three eighths as a decimal? Dear gosh, no. 3 0.375. So the slope of the red triangle is 0.375. Everyone write it down. We noticed, and I did this off camera, but if I have one giant triangle and I split out that triangle, this slope and this slope have to be the same in order for it to be a giant triangle. So this slope point, or is 0.4. <laughs> is 0.4 the same thing as 0.375? They are not the same number. Which means this giant triangle is not a giant triangle. It's a giant polygon. That looks like a triangle, but it's not. So Wikipedia does a much better job than I do at illustrating this. So if we, if we look at this area, you can see that there's not quite overlap. Even if you cut it out, you can't quite see it. Let me zoom in here. Looking at that bottom triangle, you can see that if I overlap the big triangle with the little triangle, you can even hold up your pieces that you cut out. Hold your little triangle and your big triangle up. If you cut it out perfectly, you should notice this slight discrepancy here. 
a slight discrepancy, which means they're not exactly the same slope. There's this sliver of area. This tiny, tiny sliver, because the sliver is so long, remember this only goes up to five, and I need to go all the way up to whatever, like 13 or whatever. This giant sliver has an area of one. That's where the missing piece went. There it is. There's the missing piece. It has an area of exactly one. And that's why when we move around our pieces, we get this happening where there's a missing piece because what I really have, and it's really hard to do, and even if you have a ruler, it's hard to do. If I were to make a line from here to here, I have too much area. Look, you can't really see it. Maybe I can use a different area, but all this sliver that's over the line, that has an area of one, and that area of one is put right there. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Crazy. Again, if you haven't get, got it yet, this area that's this sliver that's barely, I can you can barely see if I zoom in here, this area right here all adds up to exactly one, and that's where this missing piece went. <laughs> so maybe what you're taking away from this lesson is Mr. Sandel is magic, or maybe math is crazy and I don't understand it. What I want you guys to take away is this right here. Math practice six, attend to precision. This wasn't a triangle. If I was being very precise, I would have figured out, oh, yeah, if I was very precise, that isn't a triangle. It's actually a polygon because I have different slopes there. Math is a very precise. Why do you? <laughs> Math is a very precise language. It allows for some people to do optical illusions if they bend slight rules of mathematics. All right, that concludes today's lesson. You guys can work on the homework.